This is not a football game or a basketball tournament. This is a robotics competition called FIRST, where 10,000 kids from across the world descend on Atlanta and turn the Georgia Dome into a high-tech Super Bowl. Ladies and gentlemen, we're underway. This is final match number one. Really what FIRST shows people, shows the students, is that anybody can do this. I love robotics. It's only my second year on the team, and I love it. So I definitely understand technology a lot more than I had before. So what do you guys think of Dean, Dean Kamen? He's amazing. He signed our robot last year and our battery this year. <laughs> Dean Kamen, inventor of the Segway, that personal transportation device, founded first. This seems like an obvious question. What is a robot? Not only is what is a robot not an obvious question, I think it doesn't have an answer any more than what is a computer. I think a robot, to at least these kids, is a system of some hardware and some software with the ability to communicate and then to uh, interact with its environment, either autonomously or through interaction with somebody, uh, to accomplish a goal. I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. And of course, many of us think of robots as the stuff of movies, friends like R2-D2 and C-3PO, or foes like the Terminator. The truth is that in real life, robots generally can't think for themselves. Yet, they're still really just high-tech tools. The most recent example, those robots that successfully capped the gushing BP well in the Gulf of Mexico. But whether a mile below the ocean surface or high up in the skies, today's robots are slowly becoming more intelligent and more in demand. From medicine to the military, robots are changing our lives from the ground up. So I'm guessing that the carpets and the floors at the mm -hmm. iRobot headquarters are very uh -huh. clean. They very, be. very clean, yes, or else we have, we have an issue. Colin Engel is the founder of iRobot, one of the world's largest consumer robotics firms. In 2002, the company swept the public off its feet with, well, a robotic vacuum called Roomba. And yes, it's still a robot, even if it doesn't look like one. When we went and asked people whether Roomba was a robot, they would all say no. Uh, over time, I think uh, people have come to realize that you don't have to look like a human in order to be a robot. iRobot's first big creation was the PackBot, a 40-pound remote-controlled vehicle. It even searched for the dead in the rubble of the World Trade Center. On battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan, thousands of packbots do the Army's dirtiest and most dangerous jobs, like looking for and destroying improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. And the next generation of bots is on the march. A checkpoint in Iraq, you can actually do a peek under mode and actually drive under the vehicle and actually see if there's IEDs or bombs mounted to that. And your eyepiece is seeing everything it's seeing? Correct. In real time? Real time looks exactly what that is looking at, that's exactly what I'm looking at. Army Staff Sergeant Daniel Ruger believes advance warning from a robot sentry could have prevented an attack in Iraq in 2003 that nearly killed him. Um, Two grenades came over and woke everybody up. And when I was getting ready, uh, moving stuff like that, a grenade came over the wall and landed between my legs. It tried to maneuver away from it, the blast, and um, as soon as I made the corner around the Bradley, it actually injured me. Had you had something like this, do you think that would have been prevented? 100%. I have no doubt in my mind. We were given a rare look inside Fort Bliss near White Sands, New Mexico, where soldiers like Army Sergeant First Class Kenneth Kolbeck put robots through rigorous testing. Take this one that's able to hover and send video of the enemy back through the chain of command. A vehicle like this is going to save lives? It's going to save a lot of lives. Enthusiasm for robots on the battlefield, it seems, is only outpaced by the speed with which the military is acquiring them, says the author of Wired for War, P.W. Singer. We went into Iraq with a handful of drones. We now have 7,000 in the inventory. We went into Iraq with zero unmanned ground vehicles that are robotic. We now have 12,000. 
And these are just the Model T Fords, the Wright Brothers Flyers compared to what's coming. Singer spent two years talking to engineers, soldiers, and high-ranking officials about the future of robots used in combat. He says that robots still have a lot of growing up to do, especially when it comes to carrying weapons. A robot right now can already hit a apple at 800 meters using a 50 caliber machine gun. It can't, though, tell the difference between that apple and a tomato, which a two-year-old can do without thinking about it. And when you take that into war, it just illustrates all the dilemmas that come out of it. Which isn't to say we're not halfway there. Since President Obama took office, the number of drone strikes remotely controlled from bases like this one has almost doubled from Pakistan to Somalia. And while fully autonomous robots on the battlefield may be years away, an Army report recently identified 32 different tasks for robots, everything from weapons loaders to armed sentries. The report's author, Lieutenant General Michael Vane, says we have to change our thinking about what robots can and can't do. And I think what will go hand in hand with an armed robot in particular is the level of confidence that humans have culturally with machines over time. And so there's probably going to be a pace at which we will accept or not accept arm robots and autonomy. If all this sounds like sci-fi, well, consider this. Americans are already placing their lives in the hands of robots. Robots work in hospitals as orderlies and pharmacists. They even allow doctors to examine patients from miles away. Last year, more prostate glands were removed robotically by surgeons like Dr. David Samadhi than the old-fashioned way. And we should warn you, there are some graphic pictures ahead. I'm the surgeon who does the surgery from the beginning to the end. I make this skin opening, I close this skin, and they like that. Because you don't look you know, much like a robot, I have to tell you. Well, that's the whole point. A lot of people think like it's really the technology or the robot that does the surgery, but there's a huge human factor. At New York's Mount Sinai Medical Center, Dr. Samadhi is preparing to do a prostate removal. After a few tiny incisions are made so the operating tools can be inserted, Samadhi moves to a separate control area that looks like something from a video game arcade. High-definition cameras guide Samadhi as he manipulates the extremely precise arms of the robot. It's an extension of my arms, but you can maneuver it anywhere. You can navigate it all over the abdomen and get into a lot of blind spots that we will not be able to access. Along with his robot counterpart, Dr. Samadhi has performed more than 2,000 of these procedures. Samadhi says robotic surgery also comes with a long list of benefits. It's less invasive with shorter recovery time, and there's a better chance to retain sexual function. Do you see a day when the patient goes into the operating room and there are no humans involved? It's purely an autonomous robot? Well, I think the future, you never know. I think if we have like a very accurate images that we can give to the robot and it's custom-made surgery and well-designed, you'll never know. Um, that may happen. So could a machine ever be that smart? Advances in artificial intelligence may soon have an answer in the form of a question. Watson, you have control. IBM is testing a computer system called Watson that could do what was once thought to be impossible, beat humans at Jeopardy. Watson, who is Wilhelmina, that is correct. As for the humans who will be designing that next generation of intelligent robot. A whole bunch of girls bit this awesome robot. You heard it here. These engineers are the future of technology too. First. Yeah.